Okay, here we have the aptly named piston in a cylinder problem. Okay, so in this problem, what we have is, well, a piston in a cylinder. And really what this is, is, is any solid object which is up against a closed chamber and confining some gas in here. Uh, so yes, this could be a piston in your car that's moving up and down as ignition occurs here and, and we get a power cycle going on here. I don't want to get into engines though, not today, okay? Uh, this could be something as simple as a BB being shot down the barrel of a BB gun, um, something like that. Really what I want you to, to look at in this problem is we have some, some object. What it is doing is it is containing some amount of confined ideal gas in this space right here. So we've got some confined ideal gas and that confined ideal gas is going to push this piston downward. And so this confined ideal gas has some, some value or some quantity. We're gonna say there's NRT worth of gas in here. Why do I say NRT? Let's go back to the ideal gas law. We have N moles of gas. Um, there's the universal gas constant and the temperature of this gas is important. We'll talk about that in a minute here. But we've got this confined ideal gas. And what it's gonna do, because it is compressed, we're gonna allow it to push this piston downward. And it's gonna push this piston downward. It's just that the piston goes from being at some initial position in this cylinder to some final position. We'll, we'll say it's way down here later on. Uh, and so I'm gonna say this, this chamber or this cylinder goes from some initial length to some final length. So ultimately what's happening here is this gas is pushing on the piston, causing it to move downward. And in this problem, we are going to solve for the work done by this gas. That's the big goal here. How much work is this gas doing as it pushes this piston downward? And when I say gas, like I said, we're gonna let this be an ideal gas, okay? This is not gas like you put in your, your car, okay? That's fuel, okay? People get really upset about that sometimes. I don't need the internet hassling me over that. I don't need that kind of drama, okay? This is a confined ideal gas, nitrogen if you will, all right? Um, and it's gonna push this piston downward. So, uh, we're looking for the work here. Realize, while this sounds a little bit strange, we're all of a sudden pulling the ideal gas law into physics problems. Shouldn't we leave this for chemistry? No. All right, this is physics, folks, all right? So let's go through and let's solve for the work being done by this gas. So obviously, maybe obviously, let's take a look at this NRT term a little bit more and let's actually start at the ideal gas law. So here we go, we've got the ideal gas law. If you really want to make this difficult on yourself, I guess you could do this with, with a van der Waals equation, but if you're doing that, you don't need me to explain this to you on the internet, okay? So here we go, we're just gonna use this instead. Um, so we've got the ideal gas law, P is pressure, V is volume, and then I've got N moles, R is the universal gas constant, and T is the temperature. Now this is important in this. Uh, the first thing I actually want to talk about is the last variable, and that is temperature. And there's a big asterisk I'm going to put on this, and we're going to say that this is isothermal expansion. What's isothermal mean? Well, it means isothermal. That means a single temperature. We are not going to allow the temperature of this gas to change as this piston is pushed downward. Now, in reality, we would get what we call adiabatic expansion if we let this happen fast enough. I don't wanna worry about that right now. Okay, we're just trying to apply uh, Newton's laws and the work energy theorem to a slightly different situation. This comes up, uh, and so we're gonna keep this from becoming too realistic because if we really make this realistic, that, that just gets painful fast. So I won't do that to you. Um, so we're gonna keep this as isothermal expansion temperature doesn't change. Now obviously this is confined gas, so the moles of gas cannot get in or out, and the universal gas constant is, wait for it, 
constant. So the nice part about what's going on here is everything on the right hand side of the ideal gas law is going to remain constant. That's a good thing. These are constants in this problem. So there's some pressure and some volume. So let's talk about both of these. First, let's talk about pressure. This confined gas stuck in this chamber right here is pushing over the entirety of this piston face. Evenly along this piston face. So there's pressure all over this. Now remember, pressure it is defined as force over area. And there's a really corny joke about Newton playing hide and seek with some other scientists who really don't matter. Um, I guess Pascal matters in that one. I won't go there today though. Um, but you've got the whole internet. If you want to look up really bad Newton and Pascal jokes, you can. They're there, I promise. I've got pressure is equal to force over area though. That's what you need to realize. Force over area. So there's some force that's acting downward on this piston. Ah, force. Force is what we've been talking about in physics. Force is what we care about, all right? Because everything here, this was all new to us, or really old to us from chemistry. Why the heck were we talking about it? Force is, is hiding out in the ideal gas law. So I'm gonna substitute this in for pressure. I've got force over area times volume equals a bunch of constant stuff. Now let's talk about this a little bit more. The volume of this chamber. The volume of this chamber, well, that has to do with the length of this chamber as well as the area. Now I didn't do a real good job of explaining this area here just a moment ago. I've got a force over an area. So if there's some pressure against this piston face, that pressure is acting over the area of this piston face and the area of this cylinder wall up here. So, so this right here has some area A. Now again, we're interjecting this value into the problem, so you're gonna see pretty quickly it goes away. The size of this piston, we just don't care about. All right, so the volume, and you'll see why we don't care about it in just a second, volume of a cylinder is the area multiplied by, wait for it, the length. So when I substitute this in right here, very quickly you'll see why I didn't care much about the area just a second ago. Force over area times area times length equals a bunch of constant stuff. And boom, the area or the size of the piston face doesn't matter. And I know you got one kid who's going, but wait, my truck's got a Hemi, I got 6.9 liters of turbo diesel. Well, and that's that's awesome, okay? Uh, the thing is, is the, the piston face really doesn't matter there. That big displacement of an engine or big volume simply allows you to have a whole bunch of gas in there. We'll get to why that's important later on when we come up with a solution for this problem. That is the work by the gas. The area of the piston face, it's not that important at this point. Reducing this down, force times length equals NRT. So if I clean this up a little bit, I get F equals NRT over L. Well, why, why would I arrange this this way? I want you to realize this force by the gas is a function of the length of this chamber. This is really F of L. This is the force as a function of how long we let this cylinder chamber be, or the volume of this gas. The greater this gas is in volume, the less force there is. We can see that from this. If I wanted to graph this just for funsies, because that's what we do here, force versus length, you would see this function look a bit like this. I've got a vertical asymptote at a length of zero. I've got a horizontal asymptote, at, of course, a force of zero. Uh, basically what this means is, sorry kids, no matter how many times you pump up that super soaker, you're always going to have some gas in there because no matter how much force you put on that gas in there, it's always going to have some volume. You can never get down to confining a gas to zero volume until you get to a state change, but that's that's a whole other problem. That's, that's not what we're running into here. Man. 
So we've got this situation. Now this should hark back a little bit to springs. When you're talking about a spring, a spring has a, a natural length. The natural length of a spring let me use a pencil, God forbid. It feels like I'm not committing. Uh, if I was to look at a spring, a spring has some natural length. I'll call this L0. And if I stretch that spring in one direction, there's going to be some restoring force uh, back to equilibrium. Uh, if I compress it in the other direction, there's going to be some restoring force back towards equilibrium. So you see, with an ideal spring, what we see is a linear force as a function of position. Now, typically with an ideal spring, what you'll see is we talk about displacement of the spring, which really just shifts this curve over. But here I've got this curve for a spring, a really diagonal line for a spring. I want you to realize this is a little bit more complicated, right? And that's the only reason we're doing this is because really what we have is a non-ideal spring here. What we have is a real fancy spring constant. So how are we gonna find the work done by the gas? Well, let's think about this in, in terms of really work and our definition of work. So to illustrate this, what I want to do is I want to let this, this force acting downward on the piston push the piston down just, just a teeny, 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 tiny bit. Like how teeny, tiny bit? Let's let it move infinitely far down. In fact, I'm going to let it move so infinitely small downward. I'm going to say that that change in length here is dl. And so the change in length of the cylinder is going to result in some work. Now remember, work is f dot d or f d cosine theta. Now the nice part here is that the force by the gas on the piston is downward and the displacement is downward, so that cosine goes away. And so we're going to have this teeny tiny little force f of l, act downward on this over this teeny tiny little distance. And so we're going to get a teeny tiny little bit of work done. I don't want to call it the total work. I want to just call it a little bit of work. And we're going to let this thing move down just infinitely small. So we're going to have some force as a function of the length, whatever this initial length is. We're going to let this move downward some distance dl. And from this, we're going to get a teeny tiny little bit of work done. Now I could easily enough go through and calculate this. I can say dw is going to be, I've got f of l, that's nrt over l times dl, big L. And I get this teeny tiny, infinitely small little bit of work done. But you know what I really want to do here? I don't want to find an infinitely small chunk of work, all right? Remember, we're talking about our 6.10 liter, I said it, 6.10 liter turbo diesel whatever okay we want a bunch of work done not an infinitely small amount of work done that's for the europeans all right so we're gonna let this thing move a long ways down and we're gonna do a bunch of work this piston's gonna have a bunch of work done for it we're gonna burn some rubber down the road so you know what you know what would be great let's do an infinite amount of work or really let's add up an infinite amount of these infinitely small amounts of work that'll get us there right so the total work in going from way up here to way down here with our piston is going to be the infinite sum of these oh i put a little mark there that's awful pay no attention to the scratch infinite sum of nrt over l dl oh golly it almost looks like something we would see in calculus, doesn't it? That's scary. It's like calculus comes up in physics. Whew. All right. So we're going to do this integral. Now, just for funsies, since we're at it, we're here and we might as well. Let's take the definite integral of this. We're letting this piston go from some initial length, Li, or some initial position, Li, to some final position, Lf. Now, I want to go way back up here. You've got constants. N, R, and T, these are constants. So we can clean this up a little bit so it's not so scary. N, R, T, infinite sum, L, I, L, F, one over L, D, L. Cool. This isn't quite as scary. All we've got here is the integral of one over L. And we're gonna find the work. It's the natural log of L evaluated from L initial to L final. 
So, this is gonna give us L final over L initial. Now, realize, I, I know right now, if a math teacher somewhere is watching this, if your calculus teacher is watching this, their heart is exploding. They feel like I jumped a thousand steps and a thousand checks. Should this be absolute value? Did this contain a zero in between? Holy smokes, if there were any zeros in here, the world is over. No. How on earth could I have a length of zero in here? I can't. All right, calm down, math teacher. All right, there are no zeros in this, so we're all happy with this. There's gonna be some work done. NRT, LN, L final over L initial. This is, in fact, the work that's gonna be done by the gas as it pushes this piston downward. Now, here's the fun part about this, all right? What you'll notice right here, L final over L initial, this is effectively what we call the compression ratio uh, in And really the compression ratio is typically LI over LF. Uh, so I'll call this for the both motorhead slash nerd people or whoever is, is the intersection on that Venn diagram. Now we're all happy. This one over the compression ratio, when you watch a commercial and they're talking about now with a better compression ratio or something, uh, this is really what this is talking about. Um, when you're discussing a compression ratio, really what it relates is this initial length to this final length. Um, so with this, who cares? Well, I'll tell you why we care. As we make this ratio greater, or the difference between LF and LI greater, ultimately what we get is more work out of, in this case, an engine, or your BB gun, or your super soaker, or any mass that is pushed by a confined ideal gas, all right? So why is a bigger engine uh, produce more power? Why does it do more work in a given amount of time? Well, that's because it can squeeze more fuel at a given temperature into the engine. This NRT value goes up for a greater engine, or a larger engine. Okay. Now, some of you might also be wondering, well, hey, 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 what's happening? Isn't there gas on the other side of this? And absolutely, there is some gas on the other side of this. Uh, unless, of course, we're operating with this in a vacuum. Uh, but what I'm worrying about is only the work by the gas on this side. Okay. Um, if we say this is a whole bunch of gas that's always at atmospheric pressure over here, there's a little bit of work done by it. If I was to, say, block off this end of the cylinder and allow this piston to move downward through the cylinder, then yeah, this is gonna do some work. In fact, it's gonna do negative work because the force would be in the opposite direction of displacement. That would be adding a whole separate term to this. Uh, but right now, or for this problem, we're not worried about any gas over here. This is complicated enough, okay? Uh, so, without anything else to say on that, that is the piston and a cylinder problem. And that is all for now.